Welcome. This is the second study in the module one of the online Bible school. We're taking these first modules, the first studies, from the book, Will the Real Christians Please Stand Up? It's available from uh, our website bookshop and it's available from Amazon. All the studies in this module are taken from this. So I suggest that you get one and use it as a manual. Well, this is a very simple study, this second one. I've called it Pace My Ear. Uh, many who are watching will know the chorus, Pace My Ear, O Lord My God, Take Me To Your Home This Day. And it's taken from an incident in Exodus chapter 21, and we're going to look at it later. But I'm following on from the first study. We looked at the difference between a follower and a disciple. And I'm, I'm using illustrations this week to try and uh, cement it in your minds. That there's a, a world of difference between somebody who's saved, born again, got eternal life guaranteed, following Jesus, and a disciple. Somebody who will pay the price, die to self, and obtain the kingdom. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know God, the real God, the creator of the universe, there's only one way and that's through Jesus. That's what the Bible says. And that's the biggest decision anyone can make on the planet, to decide to follow Jesus. Turn around from living their own life, repent, turn around and follow Jesus. That's the greatest decision. But millions of people have done that. There are millions of Christians in the world. They're all following Jesus. But that's not the biggest decision you can make in your life once you've made that decision. The biggest decision for any Christian is to decide to be a disciple, to lay down the life, deny themselves, take up the cross and follow Christ. So why are there so few disciples? Because I would argue that we're not short of Christians. There's millions of tongue-speaking evangelical Christians in the world, and yet the world's in a mess. So we don't need more Christians, we need more disciples. There's thousands, tens of thousands of ministers, men of God, preaching the gospel every week. In thousands of churches all over the world, the gospel's being preached, people are being taught, but the world's in a mess, the church is in a mess. So we don't need more preachers, we need more holy men of God. To be saved is quick and easy and there's no cost because Jesus has done it all. He's paid the price, he's paid the cost. He gave all so you don't have to give anything to be saved. It's by faith in Jesus. That's God's part. He's done that. He's paid the price so anyone, however bad they are, however good they are, they can have eternal life. But to be a disciple is great cost. That's our part. And that's why there's few disciples there. Christians are happy for God to do his part and die and get all the benefits. But they don't want to pay the price. They don't want any cost. They want cheap grace. They want an easy Christianity. And there's no such thing if you read the epistles, if you read what Jesus said. So I've got three illustrations to try and prove that the magnitude of difference between a follower and a disciple. First, a very simple illustration. For me, it's the difference between asking a girl to go out for a meal and asking her to marry you. If I see a girl that I, I quite like and I ask them out, will you come for a meal or somewhere else? And they say, yes, we have a nice meal. If I ring up the next week and say, oh, hello, it's Morris again. I, I really enjoyed that meal. Could I take you out again? If she doesn't like me, she's not made a great commitment. She's had one meal with me. It's no big deal. She can make an excuse. She can say the cat's died. My auntie Molly has called round and I can't come. I've got to work late. Women know how to get out of it, don't they? So they can soon give an excuse and get out of it. There's no big commitment. But if I say to the girl, I want you to marry me, to give up all your life, and I'll give all my life, and we'll live together forever, that's a big undertaking. And if I ask her to marry me the first time I meet her, I I'm quite stupid, I believe. 
And she'd be even more stupid to say yes. Because it's too big a commitment. There's a cost to being married. You have to sit down and think. Because it's not all plain sailing. And so that's the difference. Going out for a meal, it's easy, it's nice. There's no commitment. But marriage, massive commitment. All right, a simple illustration. But let me, let me use one from the Bible. Let, let's go to Exodus. The children of Israel. They were slaves in Egypt. And Moses came to them. Uh, Exodus chapter 12, let me read it. Verse 29. It wasn't difficult to get out of Egypt. Verse 29. It came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not one house where there was not one dead. So God made it quite easy. He plagued the Egyptians, and the Egyptians thrust them out. They wanted them to go. And Pharaoh called uh, Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get forth, and take your flocks and your herds. Verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent upon the people and they sent them out of the land in haste for they said we're all dead men. And they, they went out so quickly they didn't even have time to bake the bread. The, uh, the dough was still in the kneading troughs. It says that the people took their dough, verse 34, before it was leavened, leavened their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. They, they didn't even have time for the bread to rise. It was unleavened. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. They borrowed the, of the Egyptians silver, jewels and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave people favour in the sight of the Egyptians. So they lent unto them the things that they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. They ran out of Egypt. Not only did they flee the slavery, that was wonderful. But to flee slavery would put them in the desert, which isn't very nice. But God was good to them. He gave them a promise. Not only that he would free them, when Moses came to them, he didn't only totally say, God's called me to get you out of Egypt, the iron furnace. But there was a promise of where they were going. God never takes you out. He takes you out to put you in. If you come out of Babylon, it's to go into Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And if you come out of Egypt, it's to go into Canaan. It's never to put you in the intermediary position in the wilderness. You need to go through the wilderness, that's training. If you leave Babylon, there's a long route through the, uh, alongside the Euphrates before you get to Israel. So there's a long journey and there were robbers on the way. But nevertheless, you go out, you come out to go in. And Exodus 3, this is what God told Moses, and I'm not going to read it, but you can check. Moses told Israel a few times the promise. This is what God said to Moses at the burning bush. Chapter 3, verse 8. God says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egyptians. That's, that's coming out. And to bring them, that's to go in, into the land, a good land and a large land, flowing with milk and honey. Unto the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perorites, Hivites and Jebusites. So there was a promise of milk and honey. So it's easy to leave Egypt. As soon as your eyes are opened and you see the benefits, milk and honey, freedom from slavery, of course they ran out. Like many Christians, as soon as you realise you don't have to pay for your sins, you can have eternal life. God can be a doctor, God can find you a job if you're lonely, if you uh, need a job, if you need a wife, God can find you a wife. There are tremendous benefits, there are promises that we tell people if they accept Jesus. We have a good message. Jesus never preached about hell to the sinners. It was always good news. And we've got good news, you can have your sins forgiven. God can be of great use here. There are tremendous benefits of following God, he'll protect you, he'll guide you. 
And so it's not difficult once your eyes are open to accept the call. And so they went out of Egypt. And it's easy to get converts if you promise them good things. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when they've been through the wilderness, they had to go into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Let's read it, Numbers 13. I'm sure many Christians will identify with what I'm going to say. I found it in practice and it's all through the Bible. And this is the principle that God doesn't tell you the end at the beginning. God tells you his vision and you think you know the end, but he doesn't tell you how you're going to get there because it takes many twists and turns. And if God told you, maybe you wouldn't start the journey. If some Christians knew what they'd have to go through as a Christian, maybe they would never put their hand up and accept Jesus. But they see all the benefits, the milk and honey. And so it was with Israel. God told them there'd be a land flowing with milk and honey. That was true. The land did flow with milk and honey. There, there were grapes the size of footballs. They carried them on the, the big staff. It was a wonderful land, verdant, fruitful. But God never told them in Egypt that the giants owned the milk and honey and the grapes. He never told them. He never told them there were giants. He never said there are giants in the land, the sons of Anak. He said it's a land flow with milk and honey. He told them all the good things and none of the bad. And when it came to going to the land, they sent spies out and they came back with the report. Numbers 13 and verse 33. Well, maybe from verse 31. Ten of the spies said this, but the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people. this stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which had searched the children of Israel, searched unto the children of Israel, said, the land through which we have gone to search is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And now we saw the giants the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept. And they said, would to God we died in Egypt. Would you believe it? Fancy God's people saying that. Would to God we were never saved. That's what they were saying. Never redeemed from Egypt. I wish we'd never put the blood on the doorpost. I wish we'd never kill the lamb. I wish we'd never run out of Egypt and spoil the Egyptians. Would to God we died as slaves. Can you believe God's people would say that? God's people haven't changed. We like the nice talk, don't we? I can hear the preacher say, everywhere the sole of your foot treads is yours. Claim the ground. Claim England for Jesus. Claim... Scotland for Jesus, claim America, claim Holland, claim Denmark for Jesus, everywhere the sole of your foot treads is yours. Well, it sounds wonderful, but they're only telling you half the story. Is that what Israel did? They marched into the land and everywhere they trod was theirs? No. They had to fight the giants. Everywhere they walked, there was another giant. Every time they, they walked another five mile, there was a walled city, walled up to heaven. They had to fight for it. We forget that. You can't take one little part of a verse of a Bible. They had to fight for every inch of the territory. And as a Christian, you can't just take the land from Jesus. There's a price, there's a cost. Christians think if we claim the land and say, devil, you have no right here and smash the devil, that we'll take the land for Jesus or march for Jesus with banners. The devil laughs at us when we march with banners, claiming the land. There's a cost. But we don't want it the cost, we just want to claim our rights, so called. So to get people to accept God because of the fear of hell is one thing. To get people to love God is quite another. You may say, well, it's not difficult to get people to love God. Oh, yes, it is. Christians don't love God. Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Christians don't follow the teachings of Jesus. I'm going to expose them as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. They don't keep the teachings of Jesus. 
But they say they love him, so the Bible's got lots of scriptures for those people. With your mouth you worship me, but your heart's far from me. Talk doesn't do it. Talk doesn't impress God, and it doesn't impress me. I've been a Christian too long. I've been a disciple too long. Talk doesn't impress me. When you're a follower, God is of great use to you. I've, I've said that. And it's true, he's of tremendous use. You can call on him for your needs. But you see, God didn't save you so he could be of use to you. God saved you so you could be of use to him. And when you become a disciple, the equation changes. It's not that God's of great use to you. You become of great use to God. God wants to meet your needs, but you're supposed to meet God's needs because God doesn't want to work in isolation. He needs us to do his work. We're his body on earth. Christ dwells in us. We're the body of Christ. And the head wants to move, but if the body's paralysed, it can. So God needs us. He doesn't have to need us. It's part of his plan. That's the way he's designed it, that he needs us to do his work. We must work the works of him that sent us. So a disciple is of use to God. A follower, God is of use to them. Can you see? It's, it's a whole changing of the roles. Paul was serving God in the light he was in. He said he had a zeal for God without knowledge, doing God's work for him. But God had to knock him off his horse and humble him. And then he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Not what I can do, what can I do for you? Or what, not what you can do for me, but what can I do for you? Lord, what will you have me to do? That's the difference. Well, I've got one more illustration. Simple study. And it's taken from Exodus 21, I mentioned it. And this is why I'm calling the study Pierce My Ear. And I'll spend the rest of the time on this. I'll read the first six verses. It's interesting because we've just had the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. And after the Ten Commandments, obviously we go through the, the law and all the divers and sundry laws. But the six verses just after the Ten Commandments, which is quite surprising because it's about slavery or servants. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. This is Exodus chapter 21. If you buy a Hebrew servant, let me stop there. That's strange, isn't it? If you buy a person, God allowed in the law for you to buy another person. A Hebrew servant, not a, not a, a Gentile, a Hebrew servant. I suppose we have strange ideas about slavery. And of course, it's an evil thing to steal a man and sell him. That's what we did. That's very evil. That was a death sentence under the law. If you stole a man and sold him, that was a death sentence. But if a man was very poor and he put himself up as a slave, as a servant, and you bought a bond slave, you bought him, then you owned him. But you saved his life. Because he may be starving to death, maybe he couldn't feed his children. Only rich people had slaves. So you need to readjust your thinking about slavery. If you've got a good master, you're actually freer than your master. If he treats you like a son, then you're freer than the master. Because if the roof blows off, you don't worry, the master will pay for it. The food in the cupboard, the master provides. The clothes you wear, the master provides. You're free. The only difficult thing about being a slave, and this is what balks us, you've got to say, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir. You've got to do as you're told. That's why we balk against it. But if you've got a good master, it's wonderful. If you've got a bad master, it's terrible. But there should be no bad masters. And so he's talking about a good master. If you buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go free for nothing. So you can't buy anyone for life. God always protects the underdog. God always protects the widows, the orphans, the, the poor people who have to 
but become slaves. If he came in by himself, then go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she bore him sons and daughters, the wife and the children should be a master's, and he shall go out by himself. Now, to prove what I'm saying is correct about good master, and if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master. This is a different type of slavery, isn't it? Have you ever heard of this? I love my master. I love my wife and my children. I will not go out free. I don't want to go out free. So if you found a good master, why would you go out free after six years? You may find a master who beats you, who rapes your wife. When, you, when you're on a good thing, you want to cling to it. So if he says, no, I've got a good master, I don't want to go free, then his master shall bring him to the judges, so he's got to say it in front of witnesses, lest the master take advantage and say he wants to stay with me forever when he doesn't. Take him to the judge, he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. So an awl's not like we pierce our ear with a little, like a needle that would go through to put an ear in. An awl is a big thing, what you'd stamp at a cow with, I suppose. It's what you punch leather with. So it's quite thick, I would suppose, a couple of millimetres. You'd have a hole in your ear. You'd be marked for life. And he shall serve him forever. So before I look at the, the parallels and the implications for us, let's just think about this slave. He's poor. And somebody buys him and he's found a wonderful master. And after six years, the master says, you can go free. And he says, I don't want to. I'll stay with you. And so before witnesses, he declares it. And the master takes him to the doorpost and marks him in his ear. So he's marked for life. So whenever anyone saw that slave, if they had a bad master, they'd look at him and say, what a fool. He doesn't want to leave his master. Of course, if they are the good master, they'd say, wow, good on you, you've got a good master. Because it says, I didn't read the end, he shall bore his ear through with an all, and he shall serve him forever. He can never be free again. Why? Well, it's simple. You don't know if you've got a good boss when he buys you. My wife was a secretary, often for big companies and, and managing directors. And she said that when she went for the interview, everything was lovely. But when you've been there a few months, you find out if the boss is a womaniser, if he wants to take advantage of you. But you'd never know at first. You don't know whether you've got a good boss. You don't know if you've got a good wife when you marry her. You could be caught in two years, but once you tie the knot and you're trapped, what a difference it can make. But after six years, you know whether you've got a good boss. A boss can't hide the fact he's a womaniser or a bad boss for six years. A man can't deceive his wife that he's a good husband for six years. Maybe a few months, maybe even 12 months or a couple of years. But it will come out. If the man's a womanizer, it, it, it won't wait six years to be unfaithful. So six years is a fair period to assess if you've got a good boss. So after six years and you can go free and you say, no, I want to stay forever. Or I want to stay with him. Then it's forever because it's your own decision of your own free will. Let me say that again. It's your own decision of your own. There's no pressure. You're not starving now. There's no pressure. You can go free. So if you decide with your own free will to stay with the master, it's for life. Can you think of scriptures as the Holy Ghost bringing scriptures to your mind? Anyone who puts his hand to the plough and looks back. It's not fit for the kingdom. Once you put your hand to the plough, we're talking about discipleship, you cannot turn back. We saw last week, sit down, count the cost, think, can I do it? Is it for life? Well, is that not similar to us? Were we not in Egypt? 
Is Egypt not a type of the world? Is, is Pharaoh not a type of Satan? He takes us captive at our will. At his will, sorry. We were slaves in Egypt. And we've been freed, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We've come out of Egypt. But the thing is, we don't know if God's a good master. We've been told that he can meet our needs. We've been told if you're sick, he can heal you. We've been told if you're lonely, he can find your wife. We tell people lots of things, and they're true. But individually, you've got to find out. You've got to find the real God. Is he a good master? Is he trustworthy? And after six years, you'd know, well, of course, this was a physical time. With us spiritually, it could be five years or 50 years, I don't know. But God will give you time to get to know the real God. So that when he challenges you with disciple, when he says, come, leave all and follow me, you can make a decision out of experience and knowledge, not out of emotions. And when you make the decision of your own free will, it's for life. And there's a great cost to being old, you're not your own. Does all this talk depress you about slavery? Well, I remember Bob Dylan. He made some sort of commitment. Bob Dylan's been in everything. He's, he's back now serving Satan again, but he wrote some Christian songs. I remember an album, I think he called it Saved or Redeemed, something like that. But I do remember a song that he wrote You've got to serve somebody. Maybe a boss and taking bribes on the side, it may be this, maybe that, but you've got to serve somebody. You cannot serve yourself. When Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way, he was lying, he did it Satan's way. You either do it God's way or Satan's way. You were just a free will. You can't please yourself, because if you're not pleasing God, you're pleasing Satan. There are only two masters, there are not three. Maybe this is a big shock to some Christians. They seem to think there's three masters. I can serve God, or I can serve the devil, or I can please myself and serve nobody. It's impossible. The Bible said there are only two masters. There's black, there's white. You can't be in the middle with grey. There's no such thing. I can imagine some Christians saying, well, Morris... It's very depressing, all this talk about slavery. Weren't we slaves to Satan? I was, I was bound by Satan. I was, a, I was a slave to Satan and sin in the world. But Christ has freed me. I'm free. That's all very true. You were a slave of Satan and you're free. You're free to be a slave to Christ. Let me read it. This is not my theology. I'm reading from the Bible. Let's read what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? So if I'm not my own, I can't do my own will, can I? I'm rebellious. If I do my own will, I'm rebellious, and actually I'm siding with Satan. Because to do my will is against God's will. So to disobey God's will, I'm disobedient. And disobedience is rebellion. For you were bought with a price. Is that not slavery? If you're bought with a price, you're a slave. You're not your own. Paul clearly said it. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are not your own. Christ freed us from being slaves to Satan so we can be slaves to Christ. How does Paul write his epistles? Paul, a bond servant. Paul, a bond servant, slave of Jesus. Don't get hung up about the word when you call it a, a slave or a bond servant. Surely you know what I'm saying. You're not your own. Doesn't matter what name you call it. Choose a name that suits you as long as you know you're not your own. So, I've I, I finished really. Three illustrations. Easy to accept Jesus, the promise of the milk and honey. Difficult to, to obtain the kingdom, to get in the promised land. There's giants, there's walled cities. Easy to accept a day to go for a meal. 
big deal to get married, it's for life. Easy to come out of Egypt and get saved, put your hand up and have your sins forgiven, it's wonderful. But there comes a time when you'll be faced with discipleship and I trust God it's when you go through this online Bible school. I trust as you go through the Sermon on the Mount, the Holy Ghost will challenge you to be a disciple. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to make no appeals, that's not my job. My job is to preach discipleship and it's the Holy Ghost's job to challenge you and give you the call. And you have a free will. You can go out free and be a follower all your life and you've got eternal life. Or you can be disciplined and chastised like a good child and become mature and be a disciple and be of use to God. God's looking for people. His eyes are running to and fro on the earth, looking for people he can use and show his glory through. You could be one of them. I made the decision long ago, never regretted it. I don't count my life my own. I don't count my family my own. I'm a completely enslaved it's wonderful. There's a security. God takes all the problems. The slave, when his own free will said, I'm yours forever, he had to be a marked man. Now, I could go through the Bible. I'm just going to give a couple of illustrations. Genesis 32 Everyone who's been used of God has had this pierce my ear experience. That's what I call it. I've seen people. I remember Jodie with a girl from Scotland one time, and I won't go into the story, but she said, this is your pierce my ear experience. You, you've been faced with it. You've got a, a decision to make. And I spot it with people because I've been through it myself and I know my Bible. Well, this is Jacob. He wrestled with the angel, didn't he? Genesis 32. And verse 24. Just before he met Esau. This was his pierce my ear experience. Verse 24, I'm jumping into the story. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, the angel took the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I'll not let you go, except you bless me. And he said unto him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he says, your name will no more be called Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince with God thou hast power, with God and man, and hast prevailed. There's a time when God marks you. You may not wrestle physically with an angel, but there's certainly a battle, there's certainly a decision. Verse 31, And as he passed over Peniel, the sun arose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. He didn't just hurt him, the sinew shrunk, and Jacob was a marked man, he walked with a limp, he halted on his thigh. I hear Christians say it would be wonderful, I want to be like Jacob, let's wrestle with God, let's be intercessors, and let's wrestle all night with God, let's prevail. And they spend all night shouting at the devil and praying. Well, it's great persevering, it's great prevailing, but there's a cost. He prevailed, he was called a prince with God, but he walked away with a limb. Are you willing to pay the price? You want to prevail with God? Jacob was a, he walked on the hollow of his thigh after that, he limped. He was a marked man. People who saw him say, you see that man, he wrestled with God. He prevailed, but it cost him. All right, let's go through the pages of the Bible. I could bring lots of others out, but I'm going to look at Isaiah. Because these are good examples. These are, many of the others are not so clear. This is, these are very clear. 
chapter 6, in the year that Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Isaiah, a man who was a prophet, and he knew God in measure, but he'd never seen the real God. Most Christians don't know the real God, they know the God of the deck doctrines because they told God's omnipresent, omniscient, they have all these wonderful words that they don't understand to describe God. God is ever present, God is merciful. But they don't know the real God, they're just attributes that they don't understand. You've got to see the real God. The next study is about Peter and you'll see that Peter had a pierce my ear experience where he saw God in a new light. Well, you know what happened? He saw the temple in heaven, not the temple in Jerusalem. And the doorpost moved at the voice and the house was filled with smoke. He saw the real God, holy, holy, holy. And what did he say? Then he said, woe is me, for I am undone or cut off. Exactly what Peter said. You'll see next week what Peter said. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He saw it, God, and he saw himself. And he says, I'm undone. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. This was his pierced my ear experience, because he was a marked man. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which is taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. A red hot coal was put on his mouth. It was a marked man. It wasn't physical, it was spiritual. Because this prophet who prophesied holy words also spoke unholy things. You see, it's easy to prophesy in church and say, Thus saith the Lord, and it may be God speaking through you. But if you go home and call your wife a silly old mule, James says it ought not to be. Out of the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. So here's a man who speaks holy words, but he wasn't holy. But once that coal had touched his lips, now when he was going to speak unholy things, they were annealed, he couldn't do it. He was a marked man. He wasn't his own anymore. He couldn't say what he wanted because his lips had been purged. So... With you, it may be physical, it may be spiritual, it may be mental. I don't know, it's not my job. But I'll tell you what, you'll be a marked man. Show me a holy man and I'll show you the marks of Christ in him. You stick with a holy man, you'll see he's a marked man. The last one is Paul. Paul said he was a marked man. Galatians chapter 6. I'll just jump into the last two verses of chapter 6. Paul says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, get off my back. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What did he mean by that? I bear in my body, not in his spirit, not in his mind. I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Well, it's simple enough to me. I don't know what you think, but Paul had been stoned and left for dead. He'd been persecuted. But that alone, being stoned and left for dead, his body certainly would be marked. He would have scars all over him. You can't have stones thrown at you without pieces coming out of you. He said one time, didn't he, you'd have given me your eyes if you could. Maybe his eyes were damaged, I don't know. But he said... Don't, don't trouble me, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus Christ. I've suffered with Christ, I'm a marked man. Discipleship is a process. This is the initial thing where God marks you, you're not your own. There's a wonderful scripture that Peter says. 2 Peter chapter 3. As I said in the first study, the, these first few seem the hardest, but actually it'll get easier because it's a process. Two Peter three, verse eighteen. 
lovely verse to end the, the epistle. What a way to end the letter. But grow in grace. Grace isn't a license to sin. Grace is Christ. You receive grace, it's Christ, his character. His grace is sufficient for you, his character, his life is sufficient for you. Grow in the life of Christ, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So I'll use that as my benediction. Think about what I've said, check the scriptures and tune in next study. And we'll look at another example. I'm going to look at the life of Peter as an example. I'm going to go right through his life and show you how he was a follower and he became a disciple. It's important. I don't apologise that we've got three studies because it's so fundamental. If you don't get hold of this, that you need to be a disciple and it's not to do with salvation and there's a cost to it. If you don't get that, there's no point going to the rest of the studies unless you can accept so, Lord, speak to people as they watch this video. And may they grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you for the next study.